Mark and I are at Carkeek Park, upper level, in Seattle, Washington today. Uh, behind us is uh, Puget Sound, if you can see the water. And behind Puget Sound is Bainbridge Island. And then behind Bainbridge Island is the Olympic Mountains. So that's where we are today. And our topic is replacement rules. So we're going to do kind of a tag team thing where I do a couple rules, I explain a couple rules, and then Mark explains a couple. So we'll take turns that way. Thank you. So imagine that my old Nova parked over there is running perfectly. And then imagine that Mark removes the carburetor from my Nova and replaces the carburetor with a mechanically equivalent carburetor. And by that I mean I'm a, car car a carburetor that functions exactly the same as the old carburetor. If my car was functioning perfectly before the replacement, it should be functioning perfectly after the replacement. If the carburetor that was taken out and the carburetor that replaced it are mechanically equivalent. Hold that idea in mind. Now, a replacement rule essentially is a rule that lets you go into a proof and remove a formula that's a, that fits a specified form and then replace it with a formula that fits a corresponding form. And the formula that replaces the formula removed will always be equivalent, logically equivalent to the formula taken out. If you follow the replacement rules accurately, they're designed to allow you to take a formula out of a proof and replace it with something that's, that's logically equivalent. So remember that logical equivalence means two statements are logically equivalent if they imply each other. In other words, it would not be possible that the two statements differ as to truth and falsity. In any situation, if one's true, the other's true. If one's false, the other's false. So replacing a formula with its logical equivalent doesn't affect the validity, and that's the essential idea behind these rules called replacement rules. The first replacement rule, it's called commutation, abbreviated COM, and here's the way it reads. Given a statement of the form P ampersand Q, the rule says you can replace that formula with the corresponding formula Q ampersand P, where the only difference between the two is that the order of the P and Q has been reversed. For example, I can take a formula A ampersand B and replace it with the corresponding formula B ampersand A. And vice versa, I can take a formula that's of the form Q ampersand P and replace it with the corresponding formula P ampersand Q. That's the commutation rule. The double slash is meant to record the idea that this is a two-way rule. I can replace a formula that has this form with the corresponding formula there, or I can go from here to here. The formula of this form can be replaced by the formula corresponding to that form. So you can go from here to here or from here to here. That's what the double slash means. And if you follow this rule accurately, then you'll be taking a formula out, replacing it with its logical equivalent. The rule has two parts. It also says that I can take a formula of the form P wedge Q and replace it with its, the corresponding formula Q wedge P, where the only difference between the two is the order that the P and the Q appear in. They've been reversed the wedge stays the same, and vice versa. I can replace a formula like this with a formula like this, or a formula like this with a formula like this. So there's our first replacement rule. Second replacement rule is called association, the associative rule, abbreviated that. And it says, if I have a formula that's a triple conjunction, P ampersand Q ampersand R. That's replaceable by, and it also may replace, the corresponding formula that's the same except that the parentheses 
have been shifted. So if these two are associated by parentheses, I can replace this formula with the very same formula except that the parentheses have been, excuse me, have been shifted over. That's called the associative rule. The parentheses cannot have a tilde on them. The parentheses have to be unencumbered in order to make to apply this rule and shift the parentheses over. And it only works if it's all ampersands all the way across. You cannot have a mixture of operators. So keep those two things in mind. Parentheses have to be unencumbered and it has to be all ands. And then the second part of the rule allows us to do this with the wedge. It says if I have a formula P wedge Q wedge R, and it's all wedges, a triple disjunction in other words, that's replaceable by, and it also may replace the corresponding formula, P wedge Q wedge R, where the only difference between the two is that the parentheses have been shifted over. And again, the parentheses have to be unencumbered, and it has to be all wedges. It cannot be a mix of operators. And that's called the associative principle. And now let's do a proof with these two rules. So, mm. so suppose I have a premise A wedge, B wedge, C, and then another premise tilde B, and I want to derive as my conclusion A wedge C. Using just the inference rules, it would be impossible to prove this valid. But we can prove it valid if we use the replacement rules in the following way. So commutation says that if I have a statement P wedge Q, I can replace that with the corresponding formula Q wedge P. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite line one in its entirety, but I'm going to replace the B wedge C with C wedge B. So these replacement rules let you take an entire line of a proof and, and repeat it. And as you repeat it, you can make a replacement. You can replace one thing for another as you repeat the entire line. You have to repeat the whole line, though, when you do this. So I carried line one down. I rewrote it. But I replaced B wedge C with C wedge B. So that's the commutation rule applied just to this part of line one. And now I'm going to apply the associ associative rule. I have a P wedge Q wedge R statement, so I'm going to repeat that entire line, only I'm going to shift the parentheses over. So I'm going to repeat the line, and I'm going to shift the parentheses over. And so that's the associative principle on line three. You see what I did? I copied the whole line over, but I shifted the parentheses. I can do that because it's a triple disjunction with no tilde on the parentheses. And now I'm going to apply the commutation rule. I'm going to think of this wedge as the pivot point, and I'm going to think of this as the P, and I'm going to think of this as the Q. So think of this as P wedge Q, and the commutation rule allows me to reverse the order of a P wedge Q formula. So I'm going to rewrite this whole line. I'm bringing it down, but I'm turning it around. I'm going to move the Q part over here, move the P part over here by um, commutation applied to line 4. See, so I just twirled it here. And this came over here, and this went over here. That's commutation applied to the whole line. And now I'm actually ready to apply disjunctive syllogism. I have a statement of the form P wedge Q, P wedge Q. I have the negation of the P part here. So I see the disjunctive syllogism pattern. P wedge Q, negation of the P, I'm allowed to infer the Q. So I'm going to bring the Q part down by disjunctive syllogism applied to lines 2 
and 5. And I've reached the conclusion, and so I've proven the argument valid. This could not have been done with the, with the uh, inference rules alone, as you can, you can see. There's no place to apply modus ponens or modus tollens and so forth. And so these replacement rules allow us to prove more things valid. They add to our system. So there's our first replacement rule proof. Thank you.